Okay. Yes. Okay, so today I'm going to um, to present a project about hybrid beam forming, um, uh, which is a collaboration with Tuche Kobal, uh, Ryoko Blitz, and Matthew uh, Andrews that we had the chance to have here today in France. Uh, let's go. Uh, we'll try to go. Uh, so in advance, sorry if I'm... Uh, sometimes not precise enough or if I do mistakes because I'm far from being an expert on wireless. So uh, if I uh, say silly things, don't hesitate to tell me. Um, so the uh, the overall goal of this project is to uh, build a simulator um, to uh, simulate the situation of hybrid beam forming going from uh, the, the signal that is sent to the, the user equipment. Uh, so here, my uh, block diagram is presented from uh, right to left in order to match with uh, the tensor multiplication that corresponds to it. So uh, the, the overall architecture of the simulator that so we have the the signal here uh, for uh, each of the each uh, going to each of the users. Then we have a um, uh, digital precoder. Then we have here a block for the analog informing. Then here we have the physical channel. And uh, in the general ar architecture, we also have the possibility to have some beam forming on the user equipments and some post coding uh, before going to the, the, to, to the final uh, receipt signal. And uh, so this uh, corresponds to uh, to simply a, a tensor multiplication uh, that can be written, for example, here in uh, in Einstein notation. So the yes. How many other chains do you have? So uh, here it's I think it corresponds to parameter b, if I'm not mistaken, Matthew. Uh, yes. So in, in fact, in the simulator, for historical re reasons, it's called I, I think it's called beam formers, but I, I think it's the same thing uh, essentially as uh, RF chains. Yes, yeah. So B beam formers, and mm. we're using that synonymously with RF chains. So B is much less than the number of antennas. Yeah. So B is less than R. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Less, uh, less than T. T is the number of oh, sorry, transmitting yeah, yeah. antennas. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, and so the the, the kind of uh, performance metric that we are uh, investigating is typically the proportional fairness over time. So sorry, last question. Just yeah, 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 yeah. The number of UE n is. Uh, do you have any assumption on n with respect to T or with respect to uh, B? Uh, generally, uh, we. Uh, I think we don't in this in the general architecture of the simulator, uh, we don't have any assumption whatsoever. Uh, but when instantiating the simulator on particular use cases, we we, we may have. But but maybe actually that uh, motivates our particular goals for this particular project. So a lot of studies kind of assume N and P are kind of the same that you can serve all users at every time step, which we're but I think in many cases, that's not a good assumption. So we're really trying to look at situations where N is much more than P, so that there's actually a non-trivial scheduling problem. So I think yeah. that your question kind yeah. of motivates uh, yeah. where we were, you know, there's a million papers on hybrid beam forming, but I think there's fewer which have that scheduling. Yeah, exactly. yeah and in particular, the, the, the main motivation of the simulator is to investigate, to investigate um, uh, in the same time, the pre-coding, the analog beam forming, and the user selection aspect. Uh, and to, to, to be honest, for the moment, uh, the beam forming and post-coding on the side of the user, it's uh, it's in the architecture of the simulator, but uh, for the moment, we don't use it. And so uh, for, for, for the rest of the talk, I will... Um, I will discuss an example of question that we try to answer with that simulator. Uh, so typically, when you when you use this kind of uh, a system, first you compute the analog beams, and you can do that once in a while. You're not uh, it's not necessary to do it at each time step. And then at each time uh, step, you will acquire the the channel matrix, and then you will run your uh, algorithm for user selection and precoding. 
And uh, the, the, the question that we wanted to answer is what is the difference if we recompute the, the analog beams after uh, the user selection phase? Can we gain something by, by doing that? Uh, of course, we, we don't really want to do that because it would be extremely expensive. Uh, so the, the, the question can be seen the other way around, which is what do we lose by not doing that? Because we will probably not do that. Um, so first I, I will show uh, a small toy example to show why this question is not uh, stupid. So imagine that, uh, you, so you have four physical antennas, you have two RF chains. Uh, here, I will assume that we have only two users and that these, both users are selected for the current time slots. Um, and for each users, we have two uh, two rays, one, one that is in line of sight and the other, uh, which is not. Um, and uh, with the, the respective path losses that are assumed here on the, on the, on the figure. So of course, if you uh, first choose the best beam for each user, you will choose the, the red, red beams um, each time because the, the, the path loss is better. Uh, but uh, if Epsi the, the angle epsilon is a relatively small compared to theta, maybe there will be a lot of interference between uh, the two users. And uh, it would have been better, in fact, to, uh, to take the indirect path. Uh, and so we, we we can simulate this. Uh, uh, we can even uh, compute exactly the, the 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 solution for this situation. And uh, depending on the value of uh, theta, here we have something that is proportional to the to the to the performance of, of the system. And uh, the, the the difference between choosing the blue and choosing the the red. Depending on the value of, of theta, can be uh, can be uh, quite high. I, I think in the worst case, it's a factor of uh, four hundred something like that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do, please do. Uh, I work on that. So, um, question number one: microwave or millimeter wave, or it doesn't matter. Uh, so uh, here, generally, we assume millimeter waves. Uh, I don't know if it changes something uh, in the general case. I mean, we're looking essentially at one frequency band. So in some sense, we're thinking of it just as a generic math problem. Yes. But when we get to the simulations, we take one of the NYU millimeter wave papers. Um, but I think it's a more general question. I don't think it really matters that much. But well, uh, we just submitted a paper to a transaction on wireless on exactly that topic. And we were thinking on the channel model for okay. millimeter wave because we took the NYU uh, model. Okay, I just on that, but it's okay. My sorry, my just my second question uh, is regarding how many channels do you use, do you uh, assume sub channel? Uh, uh, okay, are you, are you studying one channel or multiple channels? One for one. now, one. Again, that, that will depend on which frequency band you're, you're going in. It's more reasonable in a millimeter wave. And I don't know, I think, Lorenzo, you will talk about multiple frequencies, right? Um, vaguely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. You know, they're different flavors, as, as you well know, uh, depending on all these assumptions. But we try to keep it simple, simple for now. Small question. What is on the y axis? Uh, it's the trace of uh, the effective channel multiplied by the precoder. So, which is, yeah, it's essentially a, a measure of the, the quantity of signal that you will get. So we assume zero forcing. So we assume once you've chosen your users, you've got your analog beam, so you have effective channel. We then use zero forcing, so it becomes diagonal, mm. and it's then the trace. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, so of course this is a very simple and naive example. So we will try to see what happens with what happens with a more reasonable user selection algorithm. François, you you have a question? Yes, uh, I'm trying to figure out. So I mean, uh, in a concrete scenario, I mean, uh, can you really identify all these paths individually? Because here you say, uh, well, I will not use the direct uh, paths. I will use this affected one. Okay. So uh, would you have like a different, uh, I mean, how, how do you practically identify uh, paths? Okay, uh, so 
Do you want to answer so that Matthew? Or... I, I, I <laughs> this is a completely separate topic, which is basically the analog beam tracking. Um, and we can talk about that afterwards as well. But essentially, maybe mathematically we can think of it as you measure you, you have like a grid of beams. So it, it, so um both the transmitter and the receiver are essentially trying to find the, the right beam pair, and you can do that by let's say mathematically sweeping all beam pairs and measuring receive power. Uh, now in practice, of course, you can't do that because there's too many measurements. So you have to do some estimation of the function, which I think is another interesting problem that we won't talk about today. But you know, the purposes of this talk assume that it's just measurement. You, you measure all potential beams. So we don't care exactly what the path is. We just care about you know any pair of angles and uh, measure the received power and take the best. Which is impractical, but that's what we use to assume here. When you said your research question was about recomputing beams, okay. you really mean recomputing the code book or you are meaning computing the best beam? The best beam. The best beam. Mm. So, because what we have done is we have looked at one preferred beam per mm -hmm. user and multiple preferred beam per okay. user and see the, 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 the difference in the performance. Okay. Not much. Not much. The, the, that uh, I, I don't want to spoil the end of the talk, the talk but uh, we, we, we're getting pretty much the same conclusion. Yeah. 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 We, with while giving more power to the to the system because we we are uh, allowing really to to try all the beams not yeah. not only the subset yeah. of beams so yeah. so the, your your conclusion I would say is robust to even to a more powerful but I, I think yeah. conclusions like that also depend on the granularity of the code book right I mean if you have many fine grained beams then the best five would all be clustered around the same place right right well right. I mean, if you're talking about five in some sort of more distributed region, then that's, I think, we a different three, conclusion. We have 32 beams right now. <laughs> OK, so in what follows, we are going to use a greedy user selection algorithm. So which uh, runs as uh, expected. So you, uh, so for a given time slot, you start. So you, you compute. Uh, some weights for the users to uh, to to account for the for the proportional uh, fairness metric, and uh, then you start with an empty set of selected users, and uh, while uh, you have less than the maximum number of um, of uh, selected users allowed, uh, first you find the best user that you will have. So you need to do a, to do a what if computation on the precoder to compute what uh, what the performance will be. Uh, if it improves the performance, you add it to the set of selected users. And if it degrades the performance because you've already added too many too many users and you start to have uh, too, too, too many interference problems, you do not do not add this uh, this, uh, this additional user and you stop the algorithm. So you may end up with less users than the maximum allowed. So, so we call that greedy up because you start from zero. From zero, yeah. But greedy down is faster in five months. Um, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay, and easy to implement too. So yeah, why not? So uh, another question. So uh, you do this on a single antenna, so one base station yeah. instead, or in a network? Because the problem, the problem here we have only one base station. Okay, mm. because I mean the you may also be formed in such a way that you. Uh, have a negative effect on somebody in the neighboring yeah. right? Yeah. And so the totally. problem really yeah. is, uh, yeah. is a network problem. Yeah, yeah. I think in the product, we don't care about such things. I, I think that's still, a, uh, yeah. I, I think that's still, a, you know, beyond where we are now for the product wise. Yeah. I, I think for the practical scenarios, people only worry about the single transmitter at, at today. We don't know how to do that yet. Okay? <laughs> so once we would, if, once we know how to do that, I mean, I think that, that, I mean, I'm sure you know all these self free MIMO papers, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly the sort of self free problem, right? But I, I still think that's a little bit futuristic. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So uh, as far as I know. Okay. So can I just comment on Catherine's greedy down? Yeah. I think that's also, uh, sorry, you keep talking about I think that becomes less practical again when our n is much more than p 
For instance, if you can serve like 16, but you have like 100 users, yes. starting with 100 and doing really down, it may be a little impractical. Really but... right. In fact, we use it mostly for fully digital. In the hybrid or in paper, we don't do it. Right, yeah. But, but it's, it's a good part. Yeah. For fully digital, it's much better. Yeah. But there's a uh, so part of the... No, no, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I think so. If you think so, here of course you do something very fancy, which is to, to look at this. Uh, but if you, if you think in, in geometrically in these beings, right? So um, there is notion of uh, self interference, and there's also interference taken on the other. Yeah, I mean, it seems like uh, so there might be some links with what the people do in statistical physics with uh, the IV model, right? Exactly. And, uh, yeah. and so you, you may dream of looking at the spatial version where you uh, yeah. where you would use ideas like uh, because uh, you have the deep center for the IV model. Yeah, so sure. you can think also of um, yeah. uh, a way where you incorporate the principles uh, at the network level. And yeah. not only at the cell level. Right? Yeah, so, I, I, I think that's exactly it. It'd be, be good to talk about. At the moment, we're very combinatorial. We just assume all the geometry is captured in this received power. But you, you're right that if you actually try and understand more about the actual geometry, there's there's a uh, there's a lot. Uh, and I actually have some very specific questions on that. Maybe we can talk later. Okay. But yeah. um, I'd okay. be interested to get your feedback. Because I mean. We looked at, I mean, with uh, Calvin and others, we looked at this uh, deep center idea. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah. And uh, there were even patterns in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it leads to algorithms, right? And so, uh, but if you would think of it, uh, you choose, you have to choose between these, and your reward would be some SINR, right? Yeah. Then you you, you could you could dream of having some uh, deep center which does that and selects a B to a given user among, uh, mm -hmm. on, Taking into account the impact it has on others, right? Yeah. On other cells. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so here we really run simulations with the simulator that I presented earlier. Uh, so we have uh, a channel model. We have this uh, zero forcing precoding, and we use the, the greedy uh, selection algorithm. And either we uh, keep, keep the beams as uh, as planned, or we post com compute them. Uh, so for each user, we try to change the beam in order, in order to, to to see if it improves the performance. And uh, in, so here on the x-axis is the max number of users per slot, and on the y-axis is the proportional fare metric. And so, uh, long story short, it doesn't change much. Go, go to the student. Is working on that. If we have to compute the number of beams, we are because we can only only select one user per beam per PRB. So we have yeah. one channel. So that's that's the problem. But if you have narrower beam, you can select more users per PRB. Okay. And uh, in that case. The fact that you have five different beams that are very close to each other, if you can, it, it might give you much better results because you are going to be able to put more people per PR. Mm. So that's what we are going to try next is to increase the number of beams a lot from 32 okay. to 64 or even more and see the impact it's going to have on the results. Okay. On that, we have not yet done. Okay. But uh, so, so there is, we have to be careful. How many, how many beams do you have here? Uh, uh, frankly, I don't remember. Um, so, so as of now, so we have this uh, small toy example when it changed something and this uh, real simulation when it doesn't change something. So we are going to try to understand um, where uh, does it come from? And uh, just to have a better idea, we are going to compare what happens with a stupid algorithm of user selection, which will be a, a random selection of users. François? The question on the, on the slide. Yes. And so could you, uh, so what is on the way actually? So it's, it's uh, something where you measure weight, aggregated weight? Yes. Or the, sum of log rate or what? Yeah, it's the it's the proportional fair metric. So uh, it's the okay. hmm? yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But it's it's over the long time. 
over the long time period. So it's, you run you, you run this procedure every time slot, and then you measure the long term rate, and that is the yeah um, okay. I, yeah. I think it's actually geometric mean, not yeah. not long. Okay. It's uh, it's yeah. you know it's in uh, so we you know we we do it not in long space. We do the actual geometric mean. I, I, I believe this as well. And so, but yeah, it's not it's on the long the long term. Long term. So what does it mean? So I mean, because your your thing is, is static, right? Or do you have to join and leave of users? I mean, what happens? No, it's static. But uh, just by the fact that you serve the some users at time slot one, it, oh. it changes what you, who you want to serve at, at time slot two, okay. because you you want to serve the people that you have not already served. Oh. Okay, okay, okay. So you you uh you want you serve all guys in your cell, right? No? So I, I, at each time slot you will select a subset of users. Yes. Uh, but since since you want to to optimize the proportional fairness uh, okay. over time, you will be fair. Uh, of of course, uh, the the the. The, the the weight that uh, um, that gives you an incentive to serve uh, users will uh, increase for the people that you have not already served and de decrease for the people that you have uh, already served. And and so what DD means is that you I mean uh, you, you use this process at every uh, at, at uh, yeah. different frequency yeah. of time. Yeah, uh, and it's an, essentially the, the the users are weighted by the. A discrete derivative of the of the proportional fair metric yeah. at each time slot, and you say I I want to serve them proportionally to this discrete dis derivative of the proportional fair metric. Okay, and mm -hmm. the long term is the result of that when you yes. apply that to the same set of users, but uh, over many time over slots. Over many time slots, so yeah. That it has, uh, it's very very negligible. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you Sorry. You're still serving how many times? That's the so, yeah, that's the x-axis. So, yeah, the so max number the, served. It's the, it's the maximum number you're allowed to serve. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah. I thought the, it was n. The the yeah. the number of users that who are here is yeah. always the same. I don't remember, maybe sixteen or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the x-axis is the max number allowed. Mm. Right. Why? Where is this number coming from? Is it the number of RF chain? Because Let, let's say it's the parameter of the algorithm. Yeah, it, it, it was basically just saying ultimately, you know, with practical scenarios, you don't want to, you know, it's a, it, it, you're unlikely to get gains with serving more than sort of like eight users per time slot. So we just stop the greedy algorithm at some point. Okay, because it's it seems to me. Is a number of RF chain on that point because we, we do that with respect to the number of RF chain. Yeah, I, I, I think actually you're right because ultimately we associate an RF chain with each selected yes. user. Yeah, so you can also think yeah. of this. Yeah, yeah, as yeah. Of yeah. It, it, it yeah. demands to the same thing in the yeah. end. Yeah, so yeah, the yeah. Mm. yeah. Then click up to eight user leave and you see you come here six yeah. to eight. And actually, that. that in some sense motivated the start of this question because we were asked by our wireless engineers why in all these papers do you associate an RF chain with a user you know why don't you do some more general coding so they're basically saying once you selected your users why don't you do arbitrary beam selection you know again to take into account the interference and the results are kind of saying is sort of tying an RF chain to a user is is kind of okay it doesn't it doesn't really matter Okay, so le le let's compare with what happens with the random selection. So, um, here, so here, the, so the, the the first figure here is with a greedy selection. Here again is the maximum number of users that it served. Here the uh, proportional fair metric, and uh, in purple it's uh, without uh, post computation of beams, and in green it's with computation uh, with post computation. So. Here it says essentially the same thing as the uh, at the previous slide, which is that uh, green compared to purple is essentially the same. Um, but for random selection, uh, in some cases, and in particular when you you allow to to select a relatively large number of users, you have a big difference. In fact, in fact, when you uh, uh, compute the beams after the selection. Um, and to understand why, here we uh, represent uh, how the, the beams are uh, placed in the beam space 
for the users that are actually served on a, on a given time slot. Uh, so here, the, the first figure is for random selection. Uh, so on the um, x-axis, it's the uh, minimum angular distance between two beams of selected users. Uh, and uh, on the y-axis is the uh, is the, the the density uh, over over uh, time slot. Uh, and so with the random selection algorithm, in fact, the the the, the beams of the selected users are relatively close to one another. Uh, just because you you didn't do any deliberate effort to uh, choose users that have beams that are uh, far apart from each other. And in that case. When you uh, recompute the beams after the this random user selection, uh, you improve things because, in fact, you manage to find beams that are farther apart from each other. But in the case of uh, the greedy selection algorithm, and I would suspect of any not stupid uh, selection algorithm, what happens is that, in fact, you already choose uh, users whose beams are relatively far apart from each other. Uh, be because yeah, it, it, it's optimal to 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 do so. So when you try to recompute the beams, in fact, you don't gain much because you have already people that are relatively far apart from each other in the beam space. So sorry, I just realized something. We do different. We do beam selection first for time slot. Okay. So imagine we have thirty-two beams and six are of chain. Okay. Then we have to choose six beams. Okay. And then on that, we, we, we the, the, one of the constraints is we cannot change the beam selection within a time slot. So if you have okay. many channels, mm -hmm. you have to wait for the next time slot to change the beam set. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And once you have a beam set, you can choose different users in different PRB per beam already ah. selected. Okay. So you don't have a beam select. Well, of course, you have only one channel. So that's, that's, that makes the beam selection or the user selection the same problem. Okay. But you, when you have multiple channels, really you have to differentiate between okay. beam selection because the assumption is you cannot change your beam okay. multiple times in one time slot. Uh, yeah. So you do a beam selection, which is less than 32 if you have 32 beams because you have only six hour chain. Okay. Um, but you can select different users in each beam if you have many. Okay. Um, and so, so when you go from mm. one channel to multiple channel, you are going to see there is okay. a, you, you have to think of two concepts, beam okay. selection and user yeah. selection. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's that's part of the reason why we keep <laughs> one channel for now. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, 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 you have the complication. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um. So, uh, in conclusion, so, uh. What I should what I've showed briefly is that so for for some specific configuration of selected users you might gain something by uh, post -com computing the beams. Uh, however, we've seen that in a few simulations uh, the gains are marginal, if any. And essentially, the intuition is that when you have a, a real uh, user selection algorithm, in fact, you already choose users uh, whose beams are far apart in the uh, in the beam space. Uh, so in conclusion, the extra computational effort that would be required by uh, doing this post-computation, in fact, is not worth it. And uh, we, we're quite happy that it's not the case, of course. Um, and uh, uh, general conclusion. So uh, this question of this beam computation, in fact, exploit only a very small fraction of what is implemented in the simulator. So it's a really a first step in the exploration of what we can do with this simulator. And uh, I hope that we will use it to do many other things. And uh, thank you very much. And maybe just a comment here, because I think this uh, emphasizes a lot of the things that Francois has done. Actually, to compute these things, there's a lot of what if computations, you know, because you have these multiple contacts, you know, at each stage of the calculation, the effects of that depend on what then happens on the remaining parts of the calculation. So making that efficient actually was 
uh, its own set of problems that we're not talking about today. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Just wanted to clarify yeah. that um, that that's where a lot of the thinking had to go into this. Yeah. Stuff, how do you efficiently uh, implement some of these things? Because every decision is affected by things that would then happen as a consequence. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, yes, there are a lot of uh, tricky uh, coding features in the simulator. Also due to the fact that the, the, the general architecture is very agnostic of how the algorithm will work. And in particular, which algorithm will depend on which uh, and to uh, avoid never, nevertheless the double computation and stuff like that. Yeah. Something to understand better. So, I mean, uh, the I don't the simulator. So you, you have like uh, the geometry of these, and uh, the, uh, how do you compute for instance interference? Uh, uh, is there a like, notion of secondary law? Or I, I'm just trying to see the physics of it. Or yes. So uh, there, there are two answers. So the, the the first answer, the general answer, the, the general answer is that uh, essentially the once once again the simulator is extremely ag agnostic. So you, you can. Uh, plug in any channel model that you might want to to, to put in, e even uh, real traces of uh, of, uh, of experiments, for example. Uh, and for the put, so the and the second answer is that for the um, the particular channel model that we use here in the in the in the small question about uh, post computation. So as uh, Matthew said, we we use a, a model that uh, that. Uh, um, yeah, that is given in the papers about millimeter, uh, millimeter, millimeter wave uh, wireless uh, network. So I think to your question about log, they, there's a standard model where you have these clusters. So you have like uh, a distributional number of, of clusters. So maybe you think like three or four, and then within that you get some sort of scattering. But you can think of it as, it, you know, I think they typically don't model sort of a, a sort of physical antenna pattern. Mm -hmm. it, it's more. Uh, stochastic and then you just choose your number of clusters then you choose random angles for kind of like transmit angle and receive angle for the clusters again just from probably some uniform distribution and then there's some sort of fine grain scattering within the cluster but that's kind of but, but that's just one model but I, it's got a reasonable amount of traction so we uh, that's the one we've typically gone with the issue, it's not only with uh, channel matrix, it's an issue of code book, right? Um, are you looking at the at the impact of the code book on your result? Uh, I mean, so we're mainly taking it for the, for the analog beam, we're just looking at literally, you know, uniform in, in, in beam space. So we have kind of like four elevation, 15 asymptotal beams. So, and I think for the analog beams, that's fairly standard, you know, basically just DFT, uh, uh, beams. There's another whole conversation about for the precoder, the code book, and yeah. and that that maybe there's more complex things. But I think for the analog, as far as I'm aware, just physical, you know, discrete. We, we have used different code book to see the impact of code book, and as a precoder, we use zero four seven like right. Um, but we are doing the thing code. So we try to do things on the thing. No. Not right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I will try to to me envoyer sur mon mail perso par par contre. Mm. Oui, merci. Mm. Ouais, ça marche. Uh, slides. Uh, Non, ce n'est pas la notice de l'escalier, normalement. <laughs> They're assembling my staircase today while I'm speaking. OK. Je peux essayer ça. Wow. Magic. OK. What, what we are interested in. So, uh, just... Uh... Uh, bridge introduction of a uh, way of working at least uh, for most of the of the project that I'm going to talk about. So uh, we we collaborate quite closely with the business unit with the mobile networks in Nokia, and uh, the, usually how we we, we work is, is is as follows. So we identify use case with the business units, 
uh, we design the algorithm, we test on simulation, and then we file a PR, and then uh, we do a live POC on real networks if um, possible, and then still a more percentage of all this uh, possibly goes to the product. So of course, not all of them uh, went through the whole um, funnel, but uh, two of them, yes. <laughs> so let's start with uh, possibly the, um, the oldest uh, project, uh, at least uh, for myself, which uh, it's Grid of Beams optimization. Basically, we are optimizing the code book, uh, something that uh, similar to, to what uh, Francois uh, just, uh, 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 just talked about. So this is for SSB. I'm not sure how many of you are uh, really into the, this kind of uh, domain, probably. <laughs> um, but so this is uh, for SSB and CSIRS uh, beam optimization. So basically, this, uh, the same algorithm can work for two with some small adjustment. So what we want to do is basically to uh, estimate first uh, the traffic density, uh, the special traffic density of users over a long time period. So it's not the same time scale that uh, Francois is talking about. We're talking about hours. So we want to change the grid of beams every three or four hours for some technological constraint. Um, at some point, uh, we had the constraint that we could only do it what, once every 24 hours, so for example. So now, now we are, we're down to three or four hours. Uh, so basically, we we estimate the traffic density over some hours, and then basically uh, we want to find beams where it starts. Uh, to make it simple. So we, we have to, to maximize a certain function, which is a function of uh, the traffic density over uh, uh, space um, of uh, the RSRP of the receipt signal over the top. K users, so if K is equal to one, you just care for the for the best B. But in general, uh, our products also support up to two beams. So basically, you you, you receive the, the signal over two beams, and then you you you, you combine them. So um, and then you have also a fairness function that basically uh, tells you how how fair you want to be across all users. So if you want to be as fair as possible, basically. Uh, the solution is trivial, so just the very, very wide beams. But uh, uh, on the on this parameter uh, uh, omega, uh, you want to be more or less fair and achieve more or less uh, among stakeholders. So uh, what we end up doing is to solve uh, combinatorial optimization, which has some some modular structure. So I mean, we, we, there are there are known algorithms for this. Um, for this, unfortunately, um, we're, we're not being allowed to publish anything, so this is the field at which I can stay. Um, but hopefully, I mean, I convey the, the main uh, message. Um, so uh, this is the second um, uh, project I want to talk about. Uh, this is more uh, recent and uh, in recently also POCs on, on this and also uh, yeah, uh, which is energy saving in the base station. When we started that, uh, this energy saving um, activity three years ago, nobody cared, basically now everybody cares <laughs> <laughs> for clear reasons. Um, so uh, what we want to do is to switch on and off carriers over time. Uh, and uh, still the time scale that we're talking about is uh, in order to switch uh, on off the carrier, we're talking about about two to five minutes uh, to really switch it physically. And then you have to also take into account the, the time that it takes for users to switch from a carrier to another. So uh, overall it's uh, five to 10 minutes. So it's just quite a long, long time scale. So, so what you call a carrier is a sub-band, a band? It's a band. It's a band. It's a band. It's a band. So basically, the idea is that if you if you switch on a band, switch off a band, uh, the uh, associated power amplifier can be switched off. Um, so you 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 save uh, energy on that band. Of course, uh, all the users uh, have to be transferred to another band, which will uh, consume a little bit uh, more, but you know, overall less than uh, having all of them uh, on. So basically, what we want to do is to decide when to switch on and off uh, carriers. Um, we have some parameters to, to do that. 
um, and basically um, these parameters are basically threshold that say whenever the load on the sector is sufficiently high, then uh, you have to switch back uh, on. Otherwise, you have to you, you can switch switch on. So basically, we we optimize these parameters in order to well, unsurprisingly, minimize the energy consumption at the base station. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, by the way. <laughs> That's very next for this case. <laughs> when, so we want to minimize the energy consumption in the base station. And by the way, we are we're controlling sector by sector, but we want to minimize this uh, energy consumption the base station for each base station. While not overly degrading the quality of service that is measured with some APIs with high probability. So this is a probability. So uh, if you set probability one, basically you never switch off anything. Uh, if you set the probability to 89%, for example, for our, our PSCs, uh, you can get uh, up to, let's say, 11% uh, energy savings, which is what we, we achieved on, on, on real networks. <laughs> so, and then not. Oh, yeah. oh, so another question. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know. Right? Um, just looking at your picture, you could also imagine to switch to to go from a sector to let's say a new, just to make my point, right? So there is another level where you said, okay, you know, right now I have three sectors because it's so much more efficient. But it's at night. I still need coverage. So, is is that something that is physically possible? Going from changing the 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 the, the, the going from from three sectors to to a uh, to a mid, for example. Uh, with the antennas, we have not uh, because basically they they really point. Yeah, so uh, there is no way 20, can, yeah. 20 degrees. No, uh, uh, at least with, with the antennas, we have. Them. Yeah. So, but with arrays, when we are going, I, I'm wondering, right? Because you could go one step further. Uh, for, so for sure. Uh, so we, we we really act on top of what what's what's what there. So what's no. Uh, and moreover, uh, we never switch everything off. In, uh, in no, that's right. That's so, right. But, but we could. So it, it, it is possible. Um, uh, for example, we, we discussed with, uh, with uh, some operators in, in in Africa that only have one mm. uh, band, and say. Can we? Uh, yes, but yeah. be aware that. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so, um, yeah. but to Kathy's point about the arrays, there is a follow up to this where we're looking at reducing the number of antennas in the array. Right. So, there's kind of a, a, a more sort of yeah. uh, smoother version of it. It's not to go yeah. from three seconds to one, but you could think of it as actually going from narrow beams to broader beams exactly. um, as you turn off antenna yeah. elements. Yeah. So, yeah. That, that's. That's, I think, in the spirit of what you were suggesting. So. Maybe he didn't want to see it. Uh, <laughs> actually, this is something that we're testing yes, these yes. days. Uh, this, it's called my mom, you think? Yeah. Uh, actually, in, in the past. So if yeah. your connection is not so good, uh, you may just make it. Okay. <laughs> 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 okay. Pause. Um, yeah, this is, has been a debate. Uh, we, we we assume that we, no, there is no fixed cost. So uh, there has been a debate whether uh, you should, uh, because actually uh, switch on and off uh, is something that I say in order to oversimplify things, but then um, there are different um, levels at which you can switch something off. Uh, you can go from uh, uh, shallow to deep sleep. Uh, so there have been studies that apparently you should not go to deep sleep and 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 wake up uh, too often. Actually, you shouldn't do it at most once a day. But we're here that we're not talking about deep sleep. So yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a uh, very good question. <laughs> um. Yeah. And uh, yeah. In order to do that, uh, so we for that we have a paper. So uh, some references. In order to do that, we are, we are applying some Bayesian. Parametric optimization. So basically, what we do, uh, although I have not delved into the details, uh, we have to 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 to, um, to optimize these two parameters, these two thresholds for, for each sector. Um, and uh, what we do not know is uh, this function and this function. Um, so basically, we parameterize them, and uh, uh, with some Bayesian techniques, basically. Uh, 
as soon as we, we collect new KPIs, we um, uh, modify the, the, the posterior on these parameters. Uh, then we, we basically optimize this, this version in terms of the posterior, in, or with respect to the posterior, and we and we iterate. Do you have a good energy model? What kind of Actually, so we, yeah, we have good energy models because uh, there are thousands of lab tests. Huh? The nice thing about this is that basically we don't need that. Uh, so what, what we will employ a trick for which basically this thing it becomes a uh, loose search. So instead of optimizing something, you just want to do, to find the uh, the point where this function is exactly equal to, to this. So in the end, no, but um, we were thinking of um, uh, yeah, an extension to that. But yeah, we, we, we have a good model. The problem is that the model uh, depends on the really on the type of uh, hardware that we have. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah. I don't know if you have seen it's on, on the same topic. When we gave some data set on energy model, did you see that it was an ITU challenge? It okay, was just no. On energy, okay. on, they wanted energy model as a function of hardware. Okay. And then, uh, okay. And, uh, well, if you can send me the link. Uh, yeah. The, 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 yeah, we can discuss that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but, uh, just because, as you say, it's extremely dependent on the hardware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we have an internal tool that, that confuse it, but uh, yeah, if you did there something, yeah, it would be interesting. So um, then I work um, in collaboration with, uh, with Matthew as well um, on beam tracking. So basically um, you want to, this, to, to, to track the, somehow the, the position of the users in, over time with narrow beams. So still we are in the same uh, business. Um, so this is it was actually work that we did in collaboration with the standardization unit, not with the business unit. Um, so they had um, different, uh, let's say, options on the table, all uh, based on learn networks. We were the only one which were not using the learn networks, um, and uh, we were using using still some Bayesian techniques, uh, different from the the other ones. But basically, uh, the idea is that you want to uh, learn uh, a function uh, that changes over time, where the function is completely uh, unknown, or possibly you can have some prior information. And this function is the received power uh, at the at the at the user on a user basis, um, for a certain elevation and azimuth. So this this function. So you basically you want to track. Uh, the point where the the, the, the function is, is uh, yellow. So um, in order to do that, you, what you can do is to sample uh, the function at points. The thing is that you don't want to sample at too many points because otherwise you have too much overhead. So basically, you have a trade-off. Uh, if you if you uh, if you sample at at, at at all points, you have a complete view, but you have a, a huge overhead in the implement point. Um, if you had a sample at two few points, uh, clearly the, your estimation of, of function is not sufficiently good. Um, and on top, this function changes over time. So I um, think we have this this trade off that we we saw with the uh, um, with the uh, research. So and for this as well, we have a paper. So and that's that's what for is it for positioning? Uh, no, it's for for transmission. Yeah, so uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But, but yeah, one use, could also be, it, be it could also be uh, actually yeah uh, for positions you know, uh, for the first project on the group of beams uh, we we estimate the traffic density in a similar way so yeah exactly so um, but, I mean then of course the assumption is you know how much does beam angle tell you about actual physical positioning yeah. because it because it depends on reflection yeah those sorts of things so that yeah. that depends a lot on the on the environment. <laughs> Exactly. Um, then, uh, so this uh, is the fourth one, public power control. Um, also for this, we, we made some uh, live tests in Poland and uh, So um, basically, this is somehow 
as 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 uh, this as I said, a simplified version of what we just saw, in the sense that here um, we want to optimize uh, two parameters in a, that basically regulate the, the uplink uh, power that uh, are associated to a function that is unknown. Um, this function is uh, basically the fair, well, it can be defined in many ways, but how, how we define it is the fair, uh, the fairness function of the throughput of all the users in the cell. Uh, and this is the, the function. And depending on the how fairness or how fair you want to be the users, uh, this function varies. Um, so if our idea is, uh, well, dear customer, this is your, this is a function that depends on how fair you want to be, and you decide how fair you want to be in our business, in some sense. And then you, you usually the customer says, okay, you choose a brand. Uh, <laughs> 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 at least by time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so basically, we want to alert and optimize a function that is known, but for which actually um, we already know how to extend. So it always looks like this, but sometimes it's more the up, down. So um, the idea is to uh, reach the optimal uh, point of this function by um, sampling as few times as possible. And um, we could do it in 10, 10 samples. So it, uh, the important thing is that one sample goes um, several hours of, of measurements and possibly bad um, traffic performance. So you, we really don't want to uh, explore anywhere, but you want to be uh, take uh, very careful and baby steps onto the uh, uh, So, and uh, for example, there was at some point there was a bug and uh, the point went uh, uh, downwards and we, 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 the, the operator could see the, the impact. So- Sorry, I don't understand please. alpha first, what is alpha? Well, ah, yeah. So um, basically, alpha and p naught are the two parameters that we want to optimize. So, in a set of example, p naught, if alpha is, is equals uh, uh, one, basically, uh, p naught is the received power at the base station. And basically, alpha uh, uh, regulates how much you want to compensate. Now, all this is, is in, 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 is in the heat. Okay, so it's not easy. So, how much you want to compensate for the path loss. So ideally, you want to stay at you not know, equal uh, reasonable value and alpha equal to one. Problem is that uh, alpha, alpha equal to one means that the, the, the users at the cell edge with a high path loss will transmit a lot of power, and this will cause interference. So there's uh, basically a trade-off between you know and alpha that you can, you can see here. So if there were inter no interference, then alpha equal to one you know, uh, equal to maximum is it would be. Uh, the, the this is per resource block. Uh, no, no. Actually, this is these are well can, can be, but uh, no. In our case, it was uh, over all resource blocks oh. and over long time hours. So it's basically saying instead of using your full power budget, no. you you mm. uh, underclick, yeah, yeah, underclick. You are going to use less because you are close, possibly, and you are going. That's what it means. Exactly. exactly. But it's a it's really modulating the power budget. Exactly. Yeah, and this this is this standardized. So uh, uh, this is a classic thing. Uh, so this has been this crazy, I think. Uh, so this, this is the how uplink power. And, and then so this is the alpha full loop. Then there is the closed loop. Uh, so this this works at uh, indeed uh, hours, and closed loop works at uh, milliseconds. And basically, it corrects uh, this factor in a way that is uh, still not super clear to me because it depends on the project But I had uh, I talked to Stefano on, on the email uh, recently about this kind of uh, yes. Okay. So I'll explain to you why. My understanding on the link is still recently, whatever people was were doing. Uh, UE was transmitting only on one resource block per time slot. Mm -hmm. So then it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. But now that the UE is indeed transmitting possibly on multiple resource block on the mm -hmm. same time slot, this is maybe to be reconsidered a little bit. Because 
if you are close by, you might be able to transmit on a lot of resource block and get your traffic out. So, uh, actually, we, we were thinking of um, a different uh, So, uh, again, so this is standardized, so there's yeah. not much to it. Um, but um, we were thinking of a different method for um, uh, for massive MIMO and multi user MIMO yeah. Yeah. Uh, that possibly has something to be, uh, along along the lines of what, what you said. Um, but yeah, this is the de facto. <laughs> That's very interesting. Uh, yeah. I didn't know that. I, I knew about the pin power control, yeah. but I never realized it was basically yeah. modulating the power budget per yeah. time slot. Mm -hmm. And then there's switch load loop. So, yeah. the, but the problem is that uh, if you choose um, uh, not so well the pin and alpha, the boost loop will suffer. So, uh, ideally, uh, you choose uh, whatever, whatever. Uh, parameter will never value for these parameters on the closed loop. Uh, if it's well designed, will catch up, but it doesn't work. Yeah. It's cool, close, uh, work step by step. Okay. 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 Um, certainly, in the realm of energy savings, which is going to mention this big topic, I think what Catherine was saying is that I think that, that there's really sort of two themes to how you save energy in the wireless networks. One is you just keep the same sort of uh, transmit power level, but you try and do it less often or on fewer resources. So the question is, do you somehow figure out, you're, okay, I'm going to transmit on fewer PRBs or, or something? Or you could say, okay, I'm going to transmit over more resources and kind of smooth things out mm -hmm. uh, over time and frequency. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's different approaches and it's not immediately clear, mm -hmm. you know, obviously probably... The optimum is some combination of them, but I think all these different dimensions when it comes to power management, those different approaches, uh, yeah. I think it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and then I think the the last one. Um, just, just check the time. Are you still with me? Uh, can I? <laughs> okay. This is just just the last one. So um, this is a completely different topic. <laughs> it's a, a radiation exposure mitigation. So basically, uh, depending on the frequency that you're transmitting on, there are different levels of uh, power uh, density that our uh, body can 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 yeah uh, support. Um, so uh, basically, <laughs> we have uh, some limits on the exposure that depends on the frequency that we want to satisfy. Um, and don't worry, these limits are overly conservative. So there's no, I mean, uh, oh, uh, one thing, the, the limit is conservative. Second thing, this is in the worst case where all the users find themselves in the main, exactly in the main lobe uh, of the beam. So, I mean, this never happens. But of course, uh, in order to, I mean, since these are serious things, uh, people want to be overly conservative. But what, what is the problem on the traffic performance is that if you want to be over conservative on this, then you will suffer on the traffic uh, performance. So especially with uh, narrow beams and uh, as beams uh, uh, go narrower and narrower, uh, this problem is actually even more hard felt in 5G and possibly 6G than, than 4G. 4G was not, EMF was not even a topic. It started with, with 5G. Maybe it's worth saying this is not kind of a company problem, this is kind of a government yeah. problem, it's, it's kind a of regulatory uh, exactly. requirements. Exactly. So they tend to be kind of country specific. It's country specific, and for example, uh, in Italy, uh, is, uh, they're super strict uh, on this and uh, super conservative. In fact, we have some um, quite a few interactions with the World Water from Italy. That is, uh, um, so so, then can you repeat what is CI damage? Yeah, I do, and then next time. Oh, <laughs> because because it's very important to find a mean to, to I mean it's, it's good to say it, but you have to be able to compute it. So we are able to compute it. It's uh, it's basically um the ERP EIRP, yeah. so yeah, effective isotropic uh, repeat power thing, uh, which is basically uh, the uh, the power density um uh or in the direction of um, main um of ma ma maximum uh, beam gain 
So uh, you you know how your beam is 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 uh, is, is shaped. Uh, you know what is the input power. Uh, you know how many PRBs you are uh, given to the user, so you can compute this. Uh, this. So this is computer at the base station. So this is not due, due to measurements. This is the computer base station under the a conservative assumption that uh, everybody is uh, is indeed in the, the, the direction of, of mass being thing. And this gamma is what we uh, decide. So we, we decide that um, basically every 100 milliseconds, uh, we say, okay, um, you base station, you cannot transmit more than C gamma, C of gamma um, um, power density over the direction of maximum beam. Problem is that, so, uh, and the, this, this constraint is by regulation. Regulations say that every six minutes, you, you, you compute the, the average of the ART, and this has to be smaller than something that depends on the frequency at which you're transmitting. So we, it's a hard constraint for us, actually very, very hard. <laughs> um, and we have to deal with that. This is a constraint that basically we provide uh, to the operator saying, okay, we know that it's like that, but we're able to uh, ensure that this gamma is never too low at any time, because otherwise uh, you, you may have some on-off uh, behavior. You transmit the full power, you don't transmit. So we don't do that. Um, and at the same time, we uh, maximize uh, some function of this power. So basically, we want to maximize, uh, let's say, the fairness of this power over time. So we want, want it to be as smooth as possible. Still, you, we don't want to, to have on-off, but such that the regulations are, uh, are okay, and such that you, you never go too low at the end. Can I ask a question? So, uh, <clears throat> so the standards are based on averaging, right? Yes. So does one know the effect on health of the, I mean, if at a for given uh, time slot as you press uh, um, lots of uh, base stations or base stations that will be focused on you, there is no peak. There is no peak. There is no peak. So, um, peak so um, I'm not an expert on this, but uh, I know that there are studies for which if you're exposed to a high peak over, so high, as high as a uh, base station can, can provide, but for a small uh, period of time, is is not a, a serious issue. The issue starts if you're, um, uh, if you're exposed for more than X minutes, and this X uh, is six. This is cumulative, uh, six <laughs> exactly. Uh, exactly. So and you said you said it was overprotective, but yes. Uh, so in what sense? I mean, uh, yeah, in two senses. So this C already is small. So I mean, uh, they it, it, and then um, uh, this uh, C. So the, this uh, ERP is computed under the assumption that uh, you, uh, human being, you are, you are exactly. Uh, uh, in the direction of the max beam gain of the of the, the transmitter, so um, you which... you are the, uh, the beam that serves you. But, mm, but exactly. the question is, on how many beams on the on the way? It's not exactly serving that. Exactly. No, you're literally exactly. you're just a person in yeah. the beam. Yeah, you don't have to be a user, right? Yeah, so you don't have one very you exactly. have several. Oh, okay, but I mean, what again? What is the? I mean, to assess that, I mean, uh, you have to understand also what are the neighboring base stations. We don't. Uh, how many <laughs> we don't uh, okay. actually. So okay. this is uh, this would be ideal. But we cannot do it uh, for several reasons, of course. So uh, we 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 can only control a base station per base station. But I assume this is how the regulator. I assume the regulators have done this study. From our perspective, we get given this requirement. You know, yeah. you must satisfy the requirement. But I imagine both sort of exactly. issues. Uh, the, the country regulators have, have decided what the numbers should be based on all those. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're, we're being radiated by every operator in France right now, right? So we have to figure out yeah. what's allowable. Uh, uh, because I mean, uh, I say this because I mean, I was sitting in a committee, a physics committee in, um, in Belgium. They mm -hmm. wrote this book, which is using circuit geometry to assess this type of thing. Okay. Uh, really? okay. uh, there is a whole school I mean, uh, okay. uh, starting that. 
And uh, they address the question because, as you point out, I mean, the regulator doesn't tell you that the base station should not do this. So it says that the overall mm -hmm. uh, exposure uh, statistics mm -hmm. should satisfy A, B, B, C. Exactly. Uh, and there you have to understand uh, what, the, uh, what the global picture mm -hmm. is, the, uh, the network of base stations and, and the, the beam form, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and so they, uh, um, I'll send you because uh, it's a beautiful work. Uh, yeah, please, please, there's half a dozen papers mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. on using Socrates geometry to make, and so they make uh, metrics mm -hmm. uh, and they use this uh, equivalent function of uh, the current for exposure of um, meta distribution. And they make measurements to check that the statistically mm -hmm. given Socrates geometry works. And it does. <laughs> it will be sure. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm uh, really not, 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 not aware of this. But the, the key point is that I mean, the regulations are, are uh, indeed are based on average Yes. Uh, and, but they are global. You, you want They're global. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I agree. So uh, possibly there was a confusion in the sense that uh, this is, um, so there's the regulations, uh, health regulations, and then there are somehow standardization that says, Okay, you based on regulation, you should not do uh, that. So this is basically this probably does not come directly from the regulation, but it comes as Matthew said as the translation a regulation constraint that I, I can I can only uh, to, um, uh, control per on a per basis basis. Then I'm even overly very conservative. So it's overly conservative uh, in in three ways. So already the uh, the, the regulation are conservative. This okay. takes into account that, and then uh, there's also over conservative because indeed it takes into uh, it considers that a uh, user is always in the direction of, of maximum gain, which is not uh, the case over these six minutes. Because I mean, uh, even if I I, I, I move to by, by, by a few meters, I'm no longer in the maximum gain. Unless so, people want to hit you. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> that's true. But uh, yeah. This is uh, um, yeah, and for this yeah, we, we are we are testing it internally. Uh, basically, yeah, the, the idea is that so actually, so let's say mathematically speaking, that the, the problem, um, the hardest problem that I that I found is to, to find the feas feasibility region. So the, what 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 are the um, set of uh, gammas that you can satisfy at any point such that you know that in the future because this is a constraint in the future, so this sliding window, that, that this constraint will hold at any time. So actually, this is a very nice format for this that unfortunately uh, I cannot um, share. Uh, um, but, and then on top, we do some Yapanov optimization to basically smooth out uh, things. But uh, to me, the most interesting part is the physical. Uh, I'm done. So yeah, I, I give you some some reps if you, if you want to to check them out, uh, and indeed, in the, for the first and the last project, uh, unfortunately, we could not publish, but uh, possibly in the future. Well, thanks for your attention. Okay, thanks a lot. So, questions? Maybe I should have a question for you, Francois. So, if you say this was in Brussels, I, our understanding is this is largely being country specific so far. Right, so, this was for a European kind of regulation? No, so, or... no, it was from uh, uh, initially a uh, city regulation. Oh, well, so it wasn't local. But they, yeah. they, okay. they, they made, uh, uh, they made uh, so they, they go with uh, bikes, they make measurements, of, uh, and they they tune that uh, with the Model, and out of that, they compute that extreme 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 yeah. Especially in the, the, the fuzzy thing is that I mean, for uh, sub CDF, it's a lot, uh, lot of understanding the epidemiology, uh, but for millimeter weight or uh, higher frequency, I guess nobody knows. And so I don't know how this um, uh, 
things are uh, things are set right because in uh, nobody knows what sorry I didn't follow well well the people would say for instance that the um, exposure to uh, waves mm. uh, subsidiary would create a mm. higher chance of um, tumors mm. going to bone mm. especially I mean as but basically it's on the uplink. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. But mm. the people always look at me. Yes, yes. Yes. I, I agree. I agree. Uh, but uh, for that, it was proved that it's, I mean, it doesn't exist, right? Uh, so mm. Even when it's exposure close to, there is no there is no mm. increase of uh, brain tumor mm. due to exposure of, of, uh, to such significant mm. waves. But for millimeter waves, no, nobody ever used a millimeter wave cell phone. They yeah. did it at Kelly Park in Korea, South Korea. So it's, uh, and nobody knows what the thing is. So yeah. I, I was wondering, because here you, you focus on uh, lean form, yeah. which is perhaps more important for millimeter wave, mm. how they set this. Uh, this yeah. Um, yeah, I think largely we just take it as an input, you know. The customer says we're required to keep to this number, and but yeah, exactly this larger question. I, I don't think we look at much. Yeah, and so I think there are regulations which are uh, um, well, I, I don't remember exactly, but so they they, um, they they propose that as a machinery to uh, assess and check uh, the extremes of the exposure. Mm -hmm. Uh, which and, and so it's very it, it, it interesting, right? Mm, yeah, and then, then actually, there are also some uh, extensions, for example, this these constraints are uh, per, per frequency, yes, and you can you can work frequency by frequency, or you can say, okay, I want you to, to, to satisfy them uh, overall, so on some frequency, you can you want to or exceed a bit on some other, and uh, basically, this this uh, total exposure ratio yeah, that has right. been smaller than one. So for which you you can play a bit. So we have also another uh, uh, activity on how to regulate and see bar on a per uh, band. So yeah. yeah, there are many things that one can do. But I think the two two aspects should be combined, right? Because uh, what what they do is that they they they, they take a um, uh, stochastic geometry model. Mm. With a uh, phase that is a, a power control and things like that, but there is no there is no algorithm mm. Mm. on the base station which, uh, like the one that you seem to mm. validate. Right? Mm. 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 And so, what could be interesting is to see, uh, especially if you want to control the streams, mm. how much this impacts uh, things on a global scale. Mm -hmm. It's not what they do; they they don't have any don't algorithm have that tries to. Do, yeah, to, to, to control the mm. okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's very, very interesting to know. Okay, well, thanks a lot for the inputs. Okay, well, thanks for a very nice uh, uh, I'll see you for the invitation for lectures. <laughs>